Okay, so population dynamics. We're talking about populations again. Population is a, a group of individuals of the same species within an area. So we're going to talk about things that affect how they grow, how they shrink, how they move, how they um, are distributed. And um, a lot of that has to do with dispersal, which is, you know, how far they cover a geographic area, how far they go away from their native range, um, or how far, you know, after being born, after they become an adult, where do they go after that? Okay, so some examples of some dispersing animals include Africanized honeybees, which are um, honeybees which originally evolved in Africa and Europe, and they had a number of subspecies in each. But there were uh, there was a strain of honeybees that was a hybrid between these European and African subspecies, and they dispersed much faster than your um, European honeybees. Um, and once they they were actually introduced in South America and Brazil, and after they were introduced, they just dispersed like crazy, went up and down. Uh, Central and South America all the way up into southern United States with the only thing really halting them is the cold temperatures cold winter temperatures um, and so they dispersed quite quickly um, so dispersal can increase or decrease local population densities depending on the amount of immigration into a population or the emigration out of a population and dispersal is off is not studied very often because of how hard it is to um, keep track of animals as they move. They generally move uh, very long distances, um, and it's hard to figure out where they came from. So um, expanding populations are one of the best sources for studying dispersal. All right. So another example is collared doves, which are um, endemic or naturally found in Turkey and in the, the 1900s for whatever reason they started to disperse they started to um, increase their range um, and it began suddenly but it, it it was took place in small jumps so they were going at a fairly fast dispersal rate about 45 kilometers per year um, and gradually continue north more and more and more until they spread all over Europe. Well, they were also introduced into the Barbados Islands in the 1970s and by the 1980s had reached Florida and now they are spread all the way across North America into, you know, from coast to coast, from east coast to west coast. So uh, some populations will also respond to climate change and you have some natural climate change which occurs over you know, tens of thousands of years. Um, and in, in the past 16,000 years, we've had glacial retreat, glacial melt, and exposing um, land. Um, and as the earth has been warming, um, as you go more north in the northern hemisphere, your, your um, more southern species are now shifting or expanding their uh, populations. Um, and we have seen this as and evidence of this in pollen in lake sediments which has changed over time from one species to another the dispersal rate for um, plants though is much smaller about 100 to 400 meters per year um, which is similar to large mammals but much slower than collared doves and even exponentially smaller than the rate of Africanized honeybees so here are a couple of um, plant species that spread. So the maple um, spread north and east from the southwestern part of its range with glacial retreat until it has covered um, much of northeastern America into Canada. In contrast, the hemlock um, took much longer, 2,000 years, and it spread north and west from the southeast. So slightly different directions, but still in this northern trend. There are also responses, more active responses, quicker, quicker responses with changes in uh, global climate warming or global climate change, um, not natural, caused by human events. 
So Bruno and Bauer studied this mountain dwelling snail, Arianta arbustorum. There's a picture of them right here, um, which had a reduced reproduction at 22 degrees Celsius. So as um, things got warmer and warmer, they had less and less success with reproduction. So uh, climate warming was hypothesized to affect the distribution of the snail. And when they actually looked at current populations and historical distributions, uh, the historical distributions were much lower in elevation uh, compared to current distributions. So they are shifting north or shifting higher in elevation with an increase. Birds, plants, and other um, organisms have shown a similar pattern in response to global climate change. Another thing that can cause, of course, uh, changes in distributions or changes in food supply. So Holling observed numerical responses to increased prey av availability, increased prey density, led to increased density of pre predators. If there's plenty of resources and prey there, then that can support more of your predators. Um, so individuals would move into new areas in responses to higher prey densities. And this is kind of like... Um, um, they, when researchers looked at populations of lynx and hare and found them very linked, as the prey density increased, so did the predator in response to that. So dispersal in rivers and streams um, is unique because you have a constant flow in one direction, right? And it's kind of pushing everything down. Um, so stream dwellers have mechanisms to reduce the amount of you know force being pushed on them. Um, including a streamlined body and bottom dwelling and adhesive you know suckers which they can stick to rocks and stuff but um it's hard to resist floods where you have this sudden increase in you know rain or snow melt um, which increases the current and pushes all these fish um, and other organisms downstream so Mueller hypothesized that populations maintained this dynamic between upstream and downstream um, dispersal called the colonization cycle. Basically, um, organisms will continually move upstream as long as favorable conditions are found. Um, and that will kind of play against this gradual drift or um, being pushed down by floods. So that's the colonization cycle. Um, populations will also change in response to um, patches of suitable habitat. So metapopulations are subpopulations living in patches which are connected through corridors, you know, small rates, small areas where they can disperse between them. So I looked at these alpine butterflies. Alpine butterflies are kind of inhabiting these tops of the mountains and then go to a different mountain, but it's not a continuous habitat between them. So butterflies in their home meadows had about 5.8 5 5 to 15.2% recapture rate when they were found in different meadows. And the smaller the patch, the, the more likely they were to disperse to another meadow. <laughs> All right, so then uh, one thing that population ecologists will do, will look at patterns of survival. So how many in this population are surviving to the next stage, adulthood, or even just a yearling to a second year. So three main methods of estimation include a cohort life table, and that's what we have here, where you're looking at the different ages um, in years of, um, you know, whatever, this is a, annual grass um, and then calculating survivorship mortality rate survival rate and fecundity of each so in their first year these are just trying to survive not all of them um, well these are the all of them that started out surviving then each year they're going to decrease and decrease more and more um, the, there's also a static life table where you just look at all of the individuals in a population and record the age of uh, death of individuals or an age distribution where you have all the different ages um, at you know so this is more like a snapshot whereas a cohort is looking at through time 
Um, and then from an age, age distribution, you can assume differences from mortality in the different ages. So, hmm. another example uh, from a researcher, Murray collected doll sheep skulls, Obastali. Um, and the major assumption was that the proportion of skulls in each age class represented a typical proportion of individuals dying at that age. So he measured these different skulls and found, um, you know, at what ages, estimated what ages they were dying. Um, and he had a pretty large sample size, 608 skulls, and he constructed these sur a survivorship curve and found that they had a bimodal mortality rate. That um, within one year, a lot of them died. Um, and then they survived till um, a little later, between 9 and 13 years, they also died in a higher rate. So um, one thing you can look at in their three basic patterns are survivorship cur curves. In type 1 survivorship curves, the mortality of the species or the population occurs mostly among older individuals. So this includes the doll sheep, humans, large vertebrates kind of follow this pattern. Type 2, or there's a constant rate of survival uh, between all the ages. Um, it doesn't matter if you're going from 4 years to 5 years or from 10 years to 11 years. Um, the same rate of individuals will survive and reach mortality. So this includes like American robins, common mud turtles. And then there's type 3 where you have high mortality among the young, but once those make it through um, into adulthood, you have a high survivorship, so these usually live to a longer age. This includes the mackerel desert plant, plant cleome. Um, so here you have s s the three different types, survivorship uh, type 1, type 2 constantly, and type 3, where you have lots of dying at first, but then it levels off. All right, so age distributions of a population reflect its history of survival, reproduction, and growth poten potential. Miller published data on white oaks, and he found that um, what he measured was the trunk diameter, which is associated with age. The older a tree is, the thicker its trunk diameter will be. Um, and he found that age distribution was biased towards the young tr trees, so they had lots and lots of these young trees and not so much of the older trees. So they had a continual recruitment of these young, young trees. So when these older ones would die, um, these younger ones were right there to replace them. And it made for a very stable population. Um, now, the population and the climate are often linked. Um, if there are drastic changes in the climate, such as the effects of drought, this can lead to um, population declines. So Grant and Grant studied Galapagos defenses. They found drought in 1977 and, and subsequent droughts led to these age gaps where they didn't have any eggs that survived in these droughts. But this was offset by um, an exceptionally moist year where we had lots of, of nestlings in, in 1983. All right, so finally, the rates of population change are a factor of the birth rate, how many are being recruited each year into the population, and the fecundity schedule, so how many um, females are um, giving birth or laying eggs or whatever, however they reproduce throughout the different ages.